When a church is not winning souls, it is not fulfilling the command of the Lord. And you might say that's the pastor, that's the evangelism ministry, but guess what? You are a part of the church. So that's individually and collectively. <laughs> the church is pictured as the bride of Christ. It is interesting to compare the church to the first bride in the Bible, Eve. She was taken from Adam's side, and Christ's side was pierced for us on the cross. She was formed when Adam was asleep, and Christ experienced the sleep of death to create the church. Eve shared Adam's nature, and the church partakes of Christ's nature. Eve was the object of her mate's love and care, and Christ loves the church and cares for it. Adam was willing to become a sinner because of his love for his wife, and Christ willingly was made sin because of his love for the church. Eve was formed and brought to Adam before sin entered the human family. The church was in the mind and heart of God before the foundation of the world. What is Christ's present ministry to the church? He is sanctifying and cleansing the church through the word of God. And he does this work by the work of the spirit in his chosen servants. The water that we talk about in the 26th verse it's not baptism. For one thing, Paul is talking about a continuous process. We talk about that process of sanctification, process of growth and spiritual maturity. This is what it's talking about. And also, no Christian is baptized continuously. Water for washing is a symbol of the word of God. When Christ takes his church to glory, it will then be perfect, spotless, and without blemish. The word is food that nourishes the church. It is the spiritual food for the new nature of the believer. And that's why I have to partake in assembling, whether it's in person or online. That's why I have to also supplement the Wednesday experience and the Sunday experience with the weekly experience and my own devotional time. I have a responsibility to do my own studying, amen, my own preparation because I cannot stand on someone else's relationship with God. I cannot lean on someone else someone else's maturity when I find myself in a spot that I need to make grown up spiritual choices. I have to have that within myself. I have to have a mind that has been transformed. Amen. I have to have gone through a metamorphosis. Amen. Where I'm in the world and not of the world. I'm not operating according to the patterns of this world. In other words, I'm not responding like the world. I'm not vacillating. I'm not caught between two opinions. I am totally, completely, and absolutely committed. And so the purpose of the church, the church really has a fourfold ministry. Meeting man's spiritual needs is one. See, man is in sin and must be what? Born again. John 3 and 3 Jesus answered and said to him, most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. After this experience, he must live for God in his daily life. How can I live for God in my daily life? If I don't have a keen understanding of what God has commanded me to do. If I don't know his guidelines, if I don't know his paradigm, if I'm having 
attempted to adhere to his standards, understanding that I might not ascend to perfection, but I should be striving for perfection. I need to be able to do everything to the glory of God. Well, how can I learn how to do that when I'm always exposed to the things of the world that will often be contrary to the will of God, contrary to the word of God, and I don't have anything to fight against that. I don't have anything to contradict that. So everything within me and around me is sending me in the wrong direction. But now when I understand this is spiritual warfare, now I understand because I have hidden the word of God in my heart where I might not sin against him. Does that mean that I'm not going to make any mistakes? No, it means that I have the word of God that is daily producing some 30, some 60, some 100 fold. So now that is growth. Amen. That's growth. That means I don't make the same choices I made when I was 20, when I'm 30. I don't make the same choices when I'm 40 when, that I made when I was 30. So throughout my life, I should show some sign of growth and maturation. I need to grow up in Jesus. But I only can have the assistance of the Holy Spirit when I'm born again. I must be born again because when I was born from my mother Alma, our mother Alma, we were sinners in need of salvation. Our spirits were dead. But Jesus came as a quickening spirit. Make, he makes our human spirit alive. And then the Holy Spirit comes to fuse with the immaterial aspect of our being. And then we begin to grow up and develop. Our soul is then influenced by the Holy Spirit. We have clearly defined that the soul is also the immaterial aspect of us. But your soul has to be one. And your soul is the seat of your volition, your intellect, and also your children choices and feelings so I need to make sure that my soul is being influenced the right way so I can walk the right way I can talk the right way I can respond the right way I can be proactive I can be calibrated amen concerning what God would have me to do yes and so Jesus says in John 15 starting with the first verse I am the vine my father is the vine dresser Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes. Ever gone through the pruning experience before? That it may bear more fruit. So sometimes we think it's the enemy that's dealing with us or trying to destroy us. Sometimes God is pruning us. If you were a bush... How would pruning feel? It would hurt. Think about the bushes that you've pruned in your yard, the hedges that you've shaved in your yard and shaped in your yard. That would be a painful thing if you were that bush and had the feelings you have now. And the things that we deal with in our lives, when God is beginning to prune us, develop us, we oftentimes find ourselves in the fiery furnace of affliction. And that doesn't feel good. But we cannot be so caught up on how we feel because your feelings will cause you to move out of the fiery furnace, to get off of the wheel. As he is the potter and you are the clay, he's doing a work in you. You oftentimes will detach yourself from the process that he has ordained to produce more fruit in you. That means God wants you to be able to have a better yield, a better harvest. And that's not just about you. It's also about those connected to you within the confines of your sphere of influence. You have to understand that God is not dealing with you just for you. God has given you dominion. Somebody say dominion dominion God has given you a specific territory he's given you specific geography amen a geographical location that's only for you but you still have to fight to be able to possess it proficiently and give God the glory so he can sustain you within it you can't fight like the Amalekites the Jebusites and the Canaanites you got to fight like God has called you to fight and do things the way God has told you to do it and then somebody say then he began to produce the fruit in your life. 
So I need to abide in him because he's divine. How do I abide? I abide by practicing those spiritual disciplines of prayer and fasting and reading the word of God and assembling. It's worth it, ladies and gentlemen. It's worth it. That's why you don't feel like doing it. It's worth it. That's why it's not natural. It's worth it. That's why the enemy fights you so diligently to stop you from doing it because it's worth it and will always yield the right results. Somebody say it's worth it. And also the church's responsibility is meeting a man's physical needs, healing of the body. And God begins to, through the preaching and the teaching of the word of God, amen. And also James 5 and 14 says, is any among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Amen. And so so we have to understand that this is what God has put in place. And still at that, I'm still honored that anyone would ask me to pray for them. Amen. I don't take that for granted. This is what the Bible has ordained and what God is teaching here. Amen. And so if you have a pastor, you have an elder, you ought to be asking your pastor or your elder to pray for you. I'll be honored to pray for anyone and ask me to pray for them. This is what God has told us to do. This is within the church. But if you're not a part of the church, you can answer that question yourself. But also, thank God that even after we have prayed in faith, we've applied the oil. We've done everything that God has told us to do. What if God says, no, it's not my will to heal you? Someone's dealing with a no right now. Someone's contending with a no right now. A no is contesting your spiritual process and progress that you're trying to adhere to. You have to understand this is what the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 12, 7 through 10. Unless I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me. A messenger of Satan to buffet me. Lest I be exalted above measure concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. Yes, my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities and in reproaches and needs and persecutions and distress for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am what? Strong. And so Paul was used on a higher level than any writer in the New Testament. The majority of the New Testament was written by Paul. Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles. And Paul was able to respond to false doctrine and write epistles that would set them in order that was influenced by the Holy Spirit. That was not only relevant for that era, but also is relevant for now. We can apply those principles, doctrines, and teachings to our construct and setting to this day. But Paul had to deal with a thorn in his flesh. Some say Paul was not able to regain his sight back completely when he was blinded on the road to Damascus. Amen. Some say Paul had some other ailments, but we know that Paul had an issue, but it was manifest through a messenger of Satan. But I'm thankful that Satan can only do what God will allow him to do. And God will never put more on you than you can bear. If God led you into it, he's going to sustain you within the confines of it. He will build you up where you're torn down. He will strengthen you where you are weak. He'll give you an anointing that destroys yokes in your life. You got to declare and decree greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world i feel like preaching today someone has to understand if god be for you it doesn't matter who's against you somebody say thank you lord yes also the church is, is to facilitate the meeting of man's mental needs 
having the peace of God. Yes. Philippians 4 and 7 declares, and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So understand this, it makes no sense why I still have peace. It makes no sense why I still have my fight. It makes no sense why I still have joy. It makes no sense why I can still function within the confines of so much dysfunction. Why I have order in the midst of chaos. Why am I still on the straight and the narrow when so many things are trying to pull me off of this course? Why am I still focused on the things of God because the peace of God that surpasses, it makes no sense to you because you don't have what I have. God has given me his peace. There's something about the peace of God that will change your life. There's something about the peace of God that will help you to see things differently. There's something about the peace of God that will keep you praising in the midst of the ditch. There's something about the peace of God that will still make you a symbol even when you don't feel like a symbol. There's something about the peace of God that will make you get up in the middle of the night and get down on your knees and say, Lord, I need your help in the midst of this situation. I can't fix it myself. I can't come Directed myself. I can't heal it myself. I can't provide it, but I understand you're able. Somebody say he's able. Do you know that he's able? How many testimonies do we have in the church today? If you know that God is able, you want to say he's able. The same yesterday, today, and forever. He's still good. He's still all powerful. So yes, so we are to facilitate a peace of mind. What we preach and what we teach should help you to understand you should still have peace in the midst of what you're going through. Also, we are to facilitate and help you to understand that God will supply man's material needs. God wants to need all of your needs. Philippians 4.19 says, And my God shall supply all of your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. So when a church ceases to do those things, facilitate those things, it ceases to be a church. And it is not pleasing to God. Also, the plan of the church, the main plan of the church is for the church to evangelize the world. We must reach man with the gospel. Listen to the scripture that encases Jesus' last sermon on earth. Mark 16 and 15 declares, and he said to them, go into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. We must preach to all the world. The word preach means to give the good news of salvation. So, so many churches are focused on, again, prosperity and getting this and getting that. And that's wonderful if those things are in the rightful place. But that's not what Christ called the church to do. There are souls that need to be won. There are lives that need to be changed. There are people that need atonement. The basic necessity of the church is for us to preach the gospel. I, you don't have to be an elder. You don't have to be a minister. You don't have to stand from the pulpit and proclaim the gospel. It's not about the location is about the proclamation. Your pulpit can be on your job. Your pulpit can be at the dinner table. Your pulpit can be riding down the road. Your pulpit can be in text messages. See, we get it twisted. We're so concerned about the location and we forgot about the proclamation. You got to be consistent and let people know that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. He sent not his son into the world that the world might 
might be condemned, but that through him only and exclusively through him the world might be saved. There's only one name under heaven whereby men shall be saved, and that name is Jesus. Somebody say Jesus, Mary's baby. But see, a lot of times we get so focused on what's in the room, and we should. That's the first priority. But I want to let us know how well our church is reaching the people around the world. Burkett Chapel's Facebook page has 7,000 followers. Burkett Chapel's Twitter page has 100 followers. My public figure page, Dr. Marcus D. Floyd, has 116,000 followers. To God be the glory. Marcus D. Floyd Ministries page on Facebook has 32,000 followers. My Twitter page, I'm going somewhere, just to pay attention. My Twitter page on Twitter has 6,800 followers, amen? My YouTube page has 7,000 followers, amen? And I, my, my Instagram page has 9,000 followers. So on social media alone, watch this, we are able, when you get up and sing, when you pray, when you play, when I preach, we have the opportunity just on social media to reach 178,000 people. So we can't just focus on what's in the building. When you get up here and sing, when you, when you begin to say and do what God told you to do, people all around the world are looking at what's going on right here at Burkett Chapel, wishing they were here in the Barto area and they could be a part of this church, but yet people who are connected don't even want to come into the building. But that's not it, ladies and gentlemen. On the Christian television network, on TV. Just in Florida, we are in three million households. Nationwide, we're in multiple millions of households. But just in Florida, we are in three million households. And people actually lose sight of how supernatural that is. Do you realize you are part of a church and ministry that's reaching around the world? People are writing letters and people are talking about they want prayer. They want to get a bus to be sent all the way out to bring them to the church. People want to be a part. We are preaching the gospel to the ends of the world. To God be the glory. We are all a part of that because you are sowing into good ground and God is blessing our efforts. But we must preach to all the world. That's what we're doing. Romans 10 and 14 declares, How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? Amen. We must teach all people about Jesus. Jesus told us to teach all people. In Matthew 28, 19 through 20, this is the Great Commission. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Somebody say amen. amen. When a church is not winning souls, it is not fulfilling the command of the Lord. And you might say that's the pastor, that's the evangelism ministry, but guess what? You are a part of the church. So that's individually and collectively. So me, if I'm not trying to win a soul, you've never led anyone down the Roman road of salvation. You are missing the mark. You are not doing what God has told you to do. Amen. It's a simple process. And if you need help, I will give you resources that will assist you in leading people down the Roman road of salvation. But this is what it's all about. We're supposed to 
preach the gospel teach the gospel but don't stop at that you got to live the gospel baby you can't just talk about it it's time for us to be about it huh? people are tired of hypocrites huh? people are tired of the church saying one thing and doing another thing huh? that time is over these young folk are not going to be fooled huh, by what you say people are not trying to hear do as I say but not as I do you got to be consistent huh? you got to live this thing out huh? you got to love the way you're supposed to love huh? you got to worship the way you're supposed to worship you got to serve the way you're supposed to serve huh? you got to line up with the word of God huh? not just on Sunday but you got to line up in your house huh? you got to line up on the job huh? you got to line up in the community somebody say get an alignment huh? God will bless us huh? your alignment is up you need to allow God to fix your alignment huh? so even huh, if you find yourself in a mess huh, you automatically stay on the straight and the narrow huh? somebody say fix it Lord next the power of the church the church is the most powerful force against sin and moral decay it is the brightest hope for the betterment of the community satan cannot destroy the church matthew 16 and 18 declares and i also say to you that you are peter and on this rock i will build my church and the gates of Hades and that's the new King James version but in the King James it says in the gates of hell shall not prevail against it Satan may cripple the church but he cannot destroy the church that's the victory you have in Christ Jesus but there's nothing we can't accomplish collectively if we individually commit to staying in our lanes, being good stewards over what God has entrusted to our care. If we do all of that, God will bless us and take us places that no one thought. People still think we're not going to build on Georgia Street. The devil is a liar. We're going to build on Georgia. It's coming, 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 it's coming. It's on the way. Sin cannot destroy the church either. Romans 5 and 20 declares, Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. The greater the sin, the greater God's power shows up. Satanic forces cannot destroy the church. Man has tried with organizations, but they have failed all the way through the centuries. Final point is the people of the church. The people must cooperate. Judges 7 and 21 says, And every man stood in his place all around the camp, and the whole army ran and cried out and fled. That's being on the same page, on one accord, lining up with the vision. Amen? The people must congregate. Hebrews 10 and 25 declares, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another. See, that's why we have to come together. We encourage one another as well. If you have been blessed by today's program, please visit us at MarcusFloydMinistries.com or call us toll free at 1-855-788-0299 to partner with this ministry as we influence the world for Christ. All gifts are tax-deductible to the full extent allowed by law.